We're Rhett and Link, and we wanted to show you how we created our amazing new website with Wix. Now, we know that having a great website is crucial because... Hey everyone, how's it going? We are back on live on YouTube and today we're going to be talking about wicking beds. So we've been working with wicking beds for quite a long time here at Verge and um, have got a lot of experience with what works and what doesn't work. So today I thought I would share some of that experience with you guys. Um, it's pretty interesting. One of our most read blogs on our page globally is all about how we go about designing wicking beds. But before we get into that, I want to have you guys introduce yourself, um, where you're coming from, what you hope to learn about today. Um, and once we've got you guys introduced, then we will uh, get right into the content. So just uh, put your comments up into the comment section. Let us know where you're coming from and what you hope to learn about today uh, while we're talking about waking beds. Looks like there's 10 of you guys from all over the place right now. So... Nice to meet you, Frankie. Wellness Farms, nice to meet you. Josh Steele, hey, how's it going, man? Genevieve and Cass, Saskatoon, Wellness Farms, caregiver in Maine. Awesome, great to have you guys. Nice to have you, Adrian, from Hope, BC. Oh man, we used to spend a lot of time up in Hope, BC. I grew up in Vancouver. We had a cabin up near Manning Park. Frankie, you hope to learn about waking beds and how to implement them. Greetings, everyone. Great, guys. Feel free to share this on your social media as well. Um, it'd be great to get other people involved in the live cast um, if you've got your social media open. Okay, so as you guys come on, just continue to introduce yourself. So the way today is going to work is I'm going to talk about waking beds for 10, 15, maybe 20 minutes. We'll see how long it takes to kind of get through the main content. And then I'm going to open it up for Q&A for you guys. And we will answer questions as they come up. And you guys can place those questions into the comment section there right beside the video. Um, let me just go about sharing my blog here because that's what we're going to use for the content. So I'm just going to share my screen with you guys. So for today, we're going to be reviewing this blog that I wrote many, many years ago. So if you want to follow along, feel free to do so. I've just put the link up into the chat window um, so you can scroll over there to our website. Uh, a couple of things to notice when you're on the website there. If you're not on our newsletter, um, you can actually get this blog uh, your very own copy of it in a magazine style blog book. And you can actually see it on my screen share right now. It says, get my copy. So if you wanted to follow along in our blog book, feel free to download that uh, at any point. Um, that puts you onto our newsletter, which will also give you um, updates with regards to when we go live. We're gonna be doing this a lot more in the next little while. And I'm gonna be talking a lot about permaculture, permaculture systems, resilient homes, acreages and farms, and basically anything that we specialize in that you guys want information about. 
So open up that uh, blog book. Um, now we're going to actually go through the blog from top to bottom. And as we're doing so, I recommend that you write your questions down and then save them till the end because I won't be watching the chat window as I'm going through this blog. It's just too distracting. Um, once we get to the end of the blog, then feel free to put those questions up into the chat window and I'll make sure that I answer them on a first come first serve basis. Um, now, in addition, this, this blog was written back in 2011. So a few things have, have changed since we wrote it. Um, at the end of the blog, I'm gonna talk about some of our new learnings um, as well as some of the things that we've done to improve upon our wicking beds as well. Now, I should also mention that there are specific YouTube videos in our YouTube channel. So if you're not subscribed to that, make sure you do so. And you'll find some of our most recent videos on wicking beds as well. All right, so one of the first things to notice when you're on this, um, on this specific page on wicking beds is recently I have built an infographic right here. And it's actually, this is just a JPEG that you can download. Um, this infographic has all the best information about wicking beds and I've just recently pulled this together. So if you just right click on the infographic itself, you can actually save the image if you choose to. Um, and then you've got a copy of it for yourself. Feel free to share that around all of your social media uh, channels as well. Um, but this will make sure that you get the most important stuff. At the bottom of the infographic, I've got a whole bunch of resources that you can uh, click on in order to uh, get specific pieces of um, or materials, I should say, for the wicking bed, but also um, other little bits of info that you can uh, go check out specifically for the design and operation of wicking beds. So wicking beds, if you're not aware of, of them or haven't heard too much about them, are basically self-watering gardening beds. And you can kind of see on this image right here, generally they have some form of container. They have got gravel on the bottom, which is what forms the reservoir. And then they have a fill pipe and then there's some membrane typically that allows for water to permeate through the gravel and up into the soil, which is where the word wicking comes from. Uh, so that when you fill the reservoir with water, the water will naturally wick through capillary action up into the soil. Now, one reason that wicking beds are kind of unique is that they are generally fairly drought proof. So we're putting the water into a reservoir where it does not have access to solar radiation. So we have less evapotranspiration coming off the soil when this happens. Um, and so they've been really good for that, that reason. Um, there are some, some drawbacks with them, however, which we'll get into here in a few seconds. So as I mentioned, they typically work on capillary action. And so when you're building them, um, there is a limit to the amount of capillary action that you can actually get with a wicking bed. So the general rule of thumb that I've used is I try and keep my gravel reservoir at least 12 inches or lower. Now, if you go too low, you don't have that much of a reservoir, but if you go too high, then the capillary action starts to diminish. Now, generally speaking, I use um, a whole bunch of different types of materials, depending on the types of beds that we actually use within our gardens. And so we'll talk about different types of wicking beds next and how that might change the materials that you use. So the first type of wicking bed that I wanna talk about is in-ground wicking beds. So in-ground wicking beds are basically wicking beds that are not built into a raised bed type system. And I'm just gonna share a whiteboard here with you guys so that you can see what a raised bed wicking bed looks like. So if we just draw um, a line, we'll call that the ground. And a raised bed, sorry, an in-ground wicking bed will basically have um, a bed that is submersed below the ground itself. And I built a few of these over the years. And they work the same way as an above grade wicking bed, except that the reservoir actually sits below the ground. So this whole area down here is then filled with gravel.
And then typically there actually is a small raised bed that goes on the top. I'm going to change that to brown to indicate wood. And so that would sit right up here. And we'd fill this up with soil. And then we put typically landscape fabric right here. And then we grow our plants on the surface. And so the way that this works, generally speaking, is we have a fill pipe on the side here, and I'm just going to change the color of that. To blue. And so this fill pipe would allow us to put water. This is where we would fill it. Oops. Into that fill pipe right there. And then we would also need to have an overflow right over here. Now it's really important when you're building uh, an in-ground wicking bed that the water over on this side actually has somewhere to go. Otherwise you can end up creating a huge nasty mess when this thing actually overflows because the water can just end up pooling here. Now you might be wondering how do we prevent the water from just infiltrating into the ground? There's actually a piece that I need to talk about right here. And so generally speaking, when you build these in-ground wicking beds, you need to actually put a liner in below the gravel. Which will turn this into essentially into a pond. And this is essentially a in-ground or an, an in-ground wicking bed. And they work really, really well. Um, the place that I recommend placing these, these wicking beds, actually all wicking beds for that matter, um, there's really two main scenarios where you're gonna want to, actually there's three main scenarios where you're gonna want to use wicking beds. One is on rooftop gardens. So if you're growing on top of a roof and you don't have access to soil and you want to have a really water efficient garden, this is a great place to do it. Probably not an in-ground bed there. Uh, number two is when you're dealing with contaminated soils. So if you're growing in a place where we know that there are soil contaminants and you don't want to risk having those contaminants go into your plants, having an in-ground or segregated garden bed is going to be really beneficial. And lastly, I like putting wicking beds around homes, specifically right close to their foundation. So if you want a garden bed that's really close to the foundation of your house without being concerned about infiltration around the foundation and causing problems, wicking beds can be really good there. So let's go back to the blog and just go through um, the blog from top to, to bottom there. All right, so let's just go through some of the advantages of wicking beds quickly. So they're very water efficient. So watering from the bottom prevents evaporation of surface water, which occurs when you water the beds from the top. They are self-watering. Wicking beds are an especially great system to use in community gardens because they save people from having to drive um, every day during hot winter, during the hot weeks to water their beds. So a full wicking bed should irrigate itself for about a week, depending on how hot your climate is. They can be placed, uh, placed close to the house without risk of flooding your basement. And this is a really big advantage that I um, harp on a lot. You want to be really cautious about putting gardens too close to the house in case you're going to create damage around the foundation. No evaporation means no salting of the soil. So that's really important. If you're using high mineral water, preferably you're not using high mineral water, preferably you're actually using rainwater that's stored in a rain tank, um, but you're gonna have less salting of soil when you do use water that has a little bit more minerals because you have less evapotranspiration. They provide proper drainage in a downpour. So if you get a lot of water falling onto this because it has an overflow, uh, the garden bed will have the ability to get rid of excess water. So they've got great drainage. Um, since most wicking beds are raised, they actually warm up faster. So you can get into them earlier in the spring. You can easily attach cold frames to them, which is, which is a great way to actually build small little greenhouses within your space to extend the season on both sides, both in the spring and in the fall. 
they're great for people with less mobility because again, we can build them in a raised way. And so people that don't have mobility to get right down into the ground when we have ground-based gardens generally can use wicking beds a lot easier. And by using an intermediary tank, if you want, you can actually automate the watering of these systems. But I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, a little bit later. Now, some of the disadvantages of wicking beds, they cost a lot more to install than in-ground beds. Obviously, you've got um, some sort of a liner, you've got the cost of the wood for the raised bed, you've got the gravel. Um, you can see an image here of an example of a raised bed wicking bed, which is a little bit different than the in-ground wicking bed that we just talked about. So these are generally going to be taller than those in-ground beds. There are additional free stock considerations that need to be taken into account, which when I wrote this blog was, I, I thought was going to be a bigger issue than it is, but it turns out that even if your wicking bed goes into the winter full of water, it's not really going to cause much of an issue because the water itself will actually wick into the soil and usually the system is dry by uh, the time the winter comes along. And overall, we find that gardening in containers is more uh, difficult for plant health. Now, this has probably been the biggest problem that we've had with our wicking beds. And we have um, one, two, three, four, five, six of them on our property. Uh, what we've noticed is that because they are disconnected from the subsoils, they need to have constant amounts of compost added into them in order to make up for the lack of subsoils. Now, it's funny because gardeners will talk about how much they hate clay or um, other subsoil materials, but these materials are actually where all the nutrients are kept in, especially in clays. Clays have something called a high cation exchange capacity, which basically amounts to the fact that they have enormous amounts of nutrient in them. Now the nutrient in clays don't become available until the microbes start acting on them, which is why compost and compost teas and extracts are really important. Um, and so if you are gardening in, or, in an organic ecological way and you have access to clay, you're gonna have the most nutrient dense foods, generally speaking. But when we start working in wicking beds, typically all we put into those wicking beds are the topsoils. And then the roots can only go so deep because the topsoils are gonna to be between 10, 15, 20 inches deep. And they don't have the ability to get really deep into those subsoils like they would in a standard garden. So just keep that in mind before you go and build one of these things. They're not a panacea. They actually do have some problems associated with them. Another issue that we've noticed with them is that because they are self-watering and self-wicking, the beds themselves, um, I find it's really important to let them dry down. So I mentioned something about the possibility of actually allowing or having an automatic watering system with these things. You can do that with one caveat. You're gonna to wanna to make sure that these beds have the ability to dry down occasionally. Because what happens when soils actually dry out, they actually crack. And when they crack open, you actually end up with a gas exchange. And that's where you get new oxygen going into the soil. And then when the soils get wet again and they swell back up, then they actually will push out any of the stale gases that have formed as a result of decomposition or plant exchange. And so that's actually how plants in real life breathe is through the expansion and contraction of soils. Now, if you keep your wicking bed wet all the time and you don't allow that gaseous exchange to occur, then this is the condition that sometimes is re referred to as anaerobic conditions. And we don't want that to happen. Anaerobic conditions create all sorts of problems. So what I've noticed is that it's really good to let your bed dry down every so often. I've also noticed that having the ability to water the bed from the top down, which is kind of contrary to what I talked about at the beginning, can also be really advantageous. It's really good to put an enormous amount of water or enough to fill the garden bed anyways, onto the top surface of a wicking bed. It seems to activate all the microsites or the microbiology in the entire soil strata. Um, and so uh, even though we've got this nice fill pipe in them, I still think it's important once in a while to water it from the top down. Um, I find that to, to help the overall health of the wicking bed. So we also experimented with uh, something called media-less beds, which basically means that we built wicking beds without gravel. Now I'll let you watch this YouTube video on your own uh, after we finish this evening. Um, but these are essentially wicking beds that had some sort of voidage in the bottom. Now I used weeping tiles and I even used some perforated containers to basically create an even larger reservoir. 
Another type of wicking bed that you can buy on the market is something called the, I think it's called the earth box. And it also has a media less um, medium. Basically there is no medium, it's just water. And in order to get the water to wick up, what I used uh, was burlap sacks. Now, this is really interesting because what I found was that burlap actually wicked or had more capillary action than gravel did. And so by going medialess, I gained more water in the reservoir, but I actually sent the wicking bed into anaerobic conditions quicker because the burlap was too effective. So it put too much water into the soil. Um, so I didn't really like the medialess beds. I'm not saying that they shouldn't be built, but you may wanna start small and experiment with different types of medialess designs before you go and build a gigantic one and find out that it's too effective at wicking. Just something to think about. Um, so here's what we call an, an, uh, an above grade wicking bed. And so these are the two that are at the front of my property right here. And so you can see it's just a raised bed garden. Now I built these pretty beefy. I built them in the same way that uh, concrete form workers build forms. And so these uh, two by fours are actually what we call whalers. And it provides a lot of uh, resistance against breakage. And so these beds are very, very rigid. I mean, we could basically form concrete with them if we wanted to. That's how strong these things are. So there's an inner plywood layer. There's uh, two by fours all the way around the outside, which is what's creating that bending strength. And then we put cedar planks all the way around the outside. And then in this picture, we're actually missing the cedar uh, beauty board on the top. Now, inside of this bed, we actually lined it with builder's poly, which I don't recommend doing because if the builder's poly actually breaks, then you can end up uh, having to dig this thing out and fill it back up with gravel again. But we put builder's poly in, then 10 inches of gravel, and then filled the rest up with soil with a piece of landscape fabric in the middle. You can see an example of that right here. So we've got the gravel in the bottom, landscape fabric, um, and this is actually a wicking bed built out of those IBC totes, uh, which I have a whole YouTube series on right here. Again, you can watch that after this video here if you're interested in using these. Now, I like IBC totes because they're fairly inexpensive. You can get one of these things for free or for about 100 bucks uh, usually, and then you can cut them in half, and then you've got two garden beds that cost you all of 50 bucks plus the materials on the inside, which is a lot cheaper than building a garden bed out of cedar and wood like this. So these are the ones that are in our greenhouse and they're very effective. Um, again, they suffer from all the same consequences of wicking beds, but they also have the same advantages as well. Um, and so you can check this YouTube video out. If, and if you find it interesting, please leave some comments and uh, hit the like button on it if you find it useful information for building your own wicking bed. So here we have the wicking beds cut in half. In these particular wicking beds, we put in uh, little planter pots. So those planter pots actually increase the wicking action of the, um, of the garden bed. And so we filled these planter pots up with soil. Let's see if I can grow this bigger. Um, and so these were actually filled with soil. Then we put gravel all around them. Um, and then we put landscape fabric on top of that and then soil on top of that. So I'll just show all the, the progression of all the images here. This is in our passive solar greenhouse. You can see we have a fill pipe right in here. We've since changed the way that we do fill pipes. And so I recommend watching those other YouTube videos if you're going to end up building IBC tote uh, wicking beds. So here we have the wicking beds filled with soil. You can kind of get a sense of where the gravel is and where the soil is. Okay, so um, IBC totes have been pretty successful. Like I say, they're fairly inexpensive. Here's a in-ground wicking bed that we built. Uh, it's no longer on our property anymore, but it was a very successful bed. You can see we have a weeping tile right here, which then goes down into the ground. We have that same builder's poly underneath. This was then filled with gravel. And you can see we're on a bit of a terrace right here. So if this gravel ever filled up, it would just overflow down onto the lower terrace. We then filled that up with gravel. Again, um, we had landscape fabric and then soil. And you see the, the fill pipe right there, which is really easy to fill up with water when we wanted to irrigate it. Now, again, this bed is right next to my house. And so because we had that poly in there, I don't have to worry about it damaging the foundation uh, of my house there. There we are preparing the hole, just um, 
this should have been the first photo in the in the series there, but you can kind of get a sense that we're building the hole where the reservoir was going to go. All right. <clears throat> So overall, I have to say that we've been really happy with wicking beds, um, with the, the exception that you really do have to put a lot more energy into keeping them mineralized. Um, you do need to let them dry down. You have to remember that when you're building an above ground disconnected bed, you're basically taking those plants away from what they'd normally be used to. And so you're gonna have to replace uh, those functions that you're eliminating from the bed with more labor that you're gonna end up having to do yourself. And again, I have to caution you about overwatering them. If you water them too much, they can go anaerobic. So just keep that in mind. One last little hack that we've found that works really well is at the beginning of the year, you can actually put some red wriggler worms in there and they'll help to structure the soil. And sometimes we even go beyond the red wrigglers. We'll actually go into our actual garden and find earthworms, regular earthworms, and we'll chuck them in there as well. Earthworms really help to structure the soil and they help keep things aerobic. So we found that to be really successful. Um, I guess the last thing that I'll say about wicking beds is that it's really, really important to mulch them. So put mulch over top of the surface. It helps keep the top soil surface really moist um, and you'll have a lot of success. Here's a couple more photos of our wicking beds. So this is the wicking beds in the front of the house. Again, we've got those cedar boards. We just let them go gray. Uh, every year we have some sort of crop growing in here and we get all sorts of comments from the neighbors about whether it's chard or kale, or in, in this case, we've got carrots. When I first built these beds, I had these little, uh, they're still there actually, but I thought that this was really important. We had these little stand pipes right here. And the surface of the stand pipe is actually how we determine how much water inside the wicking bed we actually get. Um, I thought these stand pipes were really important because um, I can actually turn these stand pipes down and drain the whole bed down. Um, but since finding out that the uh, winter conditions are not all that important in that um, if we shut the, the garden down before we get really deep freezes, which we always do every year, um, the, the garden bed itself will actually drain itself down um, and it won't cause any frost issues down there. So I've since um, decided that you don't really need to have those little turn down points right here. There's another image. You can see that pipe that I was just talking about and all sorts of plants growing in here. You can see them growing all in our greenhouse right now. Um, this is the beginning of the season where Michelle's growing all of our tomatoes. We were using initially a combination of these wicking beds as well as something called global buckets. You can check global buckets out on YouTube if you're interested in learning how to grow in five gallon buckets. They work on a very similar principle. All right, so that concludes the quick tour of the wicking bed blog. Um, and I'm gonna open it up to questions now. Anybody that wants to ask some questions and I'll go look at the, uh, the comment section on YouTube. Just gonna go back up into the, the questions here. So David Homa wants to learn more about the pros and the cons. So Dave, I think we talked about a bunch about the pros and the cons. Um, but like I said, the main pros and cons are, the main pros are that you can put them close to your house and not worry about damaging foundations. The main con is that you're taking the plants away from their subsoils. And so you have to make sure that you replace those minerals and nutrients in the soil with adding all sorts of uh, composting. Wellness Farms Caregiver. I do a lot of no-till gardens and really interested in incorporating wicking beds to make it easier. Great. Well, make sure you add some questions if you have any questions uh, regarding the uh, regarding wicking beds. Did you guys manage to find the page? It says that uh, somebody said that they could not find, find the page there. I'll try po posting it back up um, from the Verge, Verge site. Question for later on salt buildup from tap water. Is that a real concern? It depends on your tap water. Um, you know, if you look at how the, um, 
Fertile Crescent was turned into a desert. It was essentially the irrigation using the Tigris and the Euphrates. Now, if you're gardening with really, really high mineral intense water, so specifically from deep wells, yes, then salting of the soil could be a concern. You can get crusting of the soils when you use really high mineral intense water. Frankie Robertson, nice front yard. Thanks, Frankie, really appreciate it. David Homa, thanks, Rob. These have been cons from my experience as well. Okay, glad I'm not the only one noticing that. Jennifer Hog Hoagland, I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing your names incorrectly. Um, sometimes it's it's tough. Um, so might have missed it, but what do you use now instead of poly underneath your gravel? Great question, Jennifer. So if you guys are gonna go to the trouble of building one of these wicking beds and you're not gonna use an IBC tote, I recommend going to an EPDM liner, which is basically a pond liner. Now it can be quite expensive. So you wanna make sure that when you're using it that you've made all your cuts properly and you've measured it all up. It's about a buck a square foot and you can usually get it at your local landscaping um, supply store. Now, when you put in the EPDM, you wanna make sure that you line the bottom with landscape fabric, then EPDM, then landscape fabric. So there's a nice layer or cushion between all of the different layers there to prevent any rocks or sharp stuff that's below it from puncturing it. Frankie, you downloaded the Verge blog book a couple days ago and how did you like it, Frankie? Love to hear. Um, Adrian Van Rosen, yeah, I found it on your blog and not sure what that comment is. Josh Steele, can you set these up in series or in parallel? Great question, Josh. So you can, absolutely. Um, you can set them up in parallel. So if you put water into one, it'll fill them all up. And you can also set it up in series as well so that one will fill up and then overflow into another. It's all about how you set up the overflows. Um, we actually have built the longest wicking beds, I'm pretty sure in the world, not that far from my house. They're 50 feet long by three feet wide. And the warning that I'll give to you about that, we did it at a community garden a number of years ago. And we did it thinking that it would reduce the amount of uh, labor or watering that community garden members have to do. And unfortunately, what it meant is that the people at the community garden, the person that had the once a week fill up duty on the wicking beds ended up having to spend two or three hours filling up garden beds, which wasn't too bad because the library was right beside it. So they could go in and read or take a book out and read while that was happening. Um, so you do have to remember that if your beds require enormous amounts of water and it requires somebody to make sure that they're not being overfilled, um, you know, that can be a little bit of a burden. So something to think about. Um, okay, Wellness Farms, caregiver. Have you seen problems with leaving soil in these beds? Do you suggest swapping out the dirt? I don't think you need to swap the soil out. Uh, I think if you're constantly adding mulch and compost into the system, I think that you'll find that um, the system stays pretty healthy. So I don't think you really need to have to change it out. I think you'd notice if the plants start getting really unhealthy. One of the things that we do on an annual basis uh, is we actually build all of our uh, own, or I shouldn't say we build it, we grow all of our own seedlings. Michelle has... Uh, soil blockers, which she uses for growing the seedlings. And so a soil blocker, if you've never heard of it, I'll just bring up uh, an example of a soil blocker here. Um, So a soil blocker makes these soil blocks and these little dimples in the soil blocks actually are where the seeds go. And so Michelle grows all of her seedlings in soil blocks and she makes her soil blocks out of a combination of worm castings, peat, sand, and then some other minerals. Sometimes she'll use soft rock phosphorus or uh, green sand for, for uh, potassium and sometimes even some bat guano or different forms of nitrogen um, if the worm castings are enough. And so if you think about it, every plant is getting this massive packed amount of nutrient right in the actual soil block itself. And so we set our plants up right from day one. They're getting microbes, they're getting nutrients. And then if you look at how many of these actually go into a wicking bed or into a garden for that matter, we're kind of um, 
replacing the nutrients right when we're planting the plants at the same time. So it saves us a little bit of time and effort when we're using them. Highly recommend these soil blocks. They can be a little bit finicky to make your, uh, your, your soil blocks. You have to get the, the mix and the, the moisture just right in order to get things working. But what's really neat about them is that there's really small soil blocks this size. So these are for getting lots of seeds on a tray and starting a whole bunch of seeds all the time. And then you can slowly move them up into ones like this, where that small block I just showed you fits perfectly into this block. And then you can move up into blocks like this, where that next size goes up into this size of a block. And so it's modular. And the other thing about soil blocks that are really interesting is that the roots will only ever go to the surface, so the air root. So you don't get these roots that are spiraling around inside of those plastic containers, which means that your plants have far less transplant shock when you put them into the ground. So I'm a really big fan of soil blockers from that perspective. You end up with healthier plants that grow quicker and they are more resilient when you transplant them because they don't have the shock of being pulled out of their nice cozy plastic container and then being put into soil that they're not used to. I'm still on designing your resilient home acres and farm series. I like when you said the most important part when consuming land is not aesthetics, valid point. Thanks Frankie. Josh, in series, are you getting different nutrients, nutrient content down the line? Well, you would only, in series, you'd only really end up getting the water transferring from bed to bed because you're not really supposed to be dissolving the soil necessarily. I guess if you were watering it from the top down, you might say that some of the nutrient will be washed out of the soil in that regard. So maybe um, <clears throat> you could maybe uh, use other um, amendments in the water, but I don't really recommend it because you could end up getting all sorts of problems in the, in the, soil, in the rocks if you were putting fertilizer or uh, compost tea into the watering system. So um, I don't necessarily think so. All right, guys, I can take a few more questions here before we run out of time. While I'm waiting for you guys to put up questions, um, I wanted to show you guys a couple of other resources that you guys can check out. Right now we have a free um, passive solar greenhouse um, sorry about that I'm just I'm doing two things at once here and I can't concentrate. Right now we have free passive solar greenhouse case studies where you can look at different passive solar greenhouses. Um, we also have a couple of other um, free online courses that you guys can check out as well which will be in the show notes. Uh, later this evening when I put this video back up onto YouTube. Uh, Josh Steele, gray water line. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yes, you could potentially put gray water into these beds. However, um, I'd be very cautious about that. Um, you could end up with a, an anaerobic situation there. So if I was going to use gray water in uh, a wicking bed, this is probably how I would do it. I'll just draw um, a little diagram out here. So gray water, if it's legal where you are and you want to use it, um, can contain hair and various other proteins and nutrients in it. And so you want to make sure that you're removing as much of that as possible. Um, in the world of wastewater, we call this uh, BOD or biological oxygen demand. And this is essentially a measure of how much nutrient or how much oxygen is needed to get rid of the nutrient within the water. So it's really important that we lower that down. And so one thing that you could do, um, I got this design from a guy named Bob Corker in New Zealand who does all sorts of gray water design and systems down there, is you could build a gray water filtration system to remove some of that BOD and any of the particulate. And so something that Bob does is he builds a box 
And then with that box, he puts in uh, wood chips. And these wood chips sit in the box themselves. And then there's a drain that you get on the other side coming off this side right here. And I'm just gonna change the color of that. And so when the water comes into the gray water system, it percolates down and it has to travel through all this mulch, which then will remove the proteins and any of the particulate, but also the mulch itself starts to become a living sponge. And so it'll actually harbor microbes and those microbes will pull out a lot of that nutrient. So the water coming through here and then picked up in a bottom drain, which needs a screen, will come through and it'll be much cleaner on the other side. Um, Bob was telling me that this can have up to a 90% reduction in BOD uh, when designed properly. And so a lot of um, gray water systems in New Zealand use this type of a system. There's actually a company that makes commercial versions of this. Let me just find them. I believe they were called biolytics. Um, I can't find it right now on Google, but anyways, it uses a very similar system. And in fact, they would put little worms in here, red wrigglers uh, on the surface so that if any particulate got stuck in the mulch, these little worms would actually consume it all. So over about two or three years, this actually turns into soil and eventually you'll have to dig it out and replace it all with, with new uh, wood chips that you have available to you. And by the way, you should make sure that these wood chips are not allopathic. So in Australia, that would be things like gum or um, camphor laurel. Um, and then in Canada or, or North America, things like cedar, you'd have to be very cautious about using uh, wood chips that have allopathic properties. So from here, you could then put your, and again, I'll just change the color here. You could put the water from this gray water system as long as you were trying to minimize contact into uh, a wicking bed at this point. And that would probably work. Um, I'd be very hesitant though to put gray water directly into a wicking bed without first processing it through something like this. So this would be called a, a gray water treatment cell. Hopefully that answers your question. Okay guys, so I have a few more uh, minutes for questions if you guys have any more. Otherwise we can uh, come to a conclusion on this. How did you guys find this? Did you find some interesting information in, um, in the webinar? And uh, is there anything else that uh, you wish that we had covered before we come to a close on this? How easy it is to build cedar wicking beds. That's all, thanks in advance. Yeah, Frankie, it's pretty easy. I mean, it's just a general uh, wicking bed. I think the uh, main thing is that you wanna make it strong enough so that you don't end up having the sides bend out uh, when you're building it. So you just need to make sure you reinforce it correctly uh, to take the uh, additional load that you're putting onto it. It's, I guess, not really any more load than you'd have <laughs> in a standard wicking bed. So, um, you know, it, it'd be very similar to that, I guess. The main addition to the um, the wicking bed itself is that you're putting in a liner and, and a couple of other materials. Genevieve and Kate, Cass, thanks so much. Yeah, yeah, thanks guys for coming. I really appreciate it. So just before you guys, uh, oh, I have a problem sealing the drain tube in the pond liner. Okay, Colin, yeah, absolutely. So when you're building this, what you want to do is you want to get something called a bulkhead uh, fitting. That's something I didn't talk about. And different types of um, wicking beds are going to use different versions of this. So let me bring one over here so you can take a look. So 
So a bulkhead fitting is a really unique uh, device and essentially it's got two um, pieces to it. Actually has three pieces to it. So it has the main fitting itself. It's got a nut and then it's got a gasket in there. Let me see if I can find a slightly clearer picture of this. Here's one. So you can see the gasket right there and then you can see the nut and you can see the other piece. And so when you're putting a hole into your rubber liner at the elevation that you wish to have the overflow, um, this rubber gasket sits on the inside and then you use a nut on the other side. Typically this, there'd be a, a piece of plywood between here as well. And as you close this down, I generally, when I'm doing this on an EPDM liner, I'll put a bead of caulking in here and that caulking will help to make sure that it seals to the, any imperfections on the EPDM liner. And then you thread this on and it's actually got a reverse thread. So it's a little bit tricky. And then you'll notice that it actually has thread on the inside as well. So if you want, you can actually get another threaded piece, thread that in, and then you can use that for your overflow pipe. And so for the gentleman that asked about tying these together in series or in parallel, these bulkhead fittings can be really uh, effective at, uh, at allowing you to tie multiple beds in series or in parallel. Um, now this bulkhead fitting, um, there's a brand, there's several brands of them. The one that you, that I've used in the past is something called uh, uh, from a company called Banjo. Um, yep, yeah, bulkhead fittings will work for liners as well. I've had a lot of success with them. And so that's what I've traditionally used in the past. All right, so I'm gonna wrap up today, guys. I've got a couple more things here to show you um, just really quickly, and then we'll call it a day. Just gonna share this with you guys quickly. You, where is it? So, well, apparently I can't figure out. There we go. All right. So, next week, I just wanted to announce quickly we will be doing um, seven tips for greenhouse design. So if you've ever wanted to learn how to design a passive solar greenhouse, we're gonna go through a few case studies and pointers on how to do this. Um, so join in next week on Monday at 4 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. We will have an announcement. If you want reminders about these things, then feel free to join our mailing list and make sure that you subscribe to YouTube. If you found today's information interesting, make sure you hit the like button on the YouTube. Um, I will be posting show notes at the bottom here later this evening and we'll put some more resources there, including a link to the Wicking Bed article as well as some other resources as well. Um, you'll notice that we have some free e-courses in those resources. Feel free to check them out. One on resilient homes, acreages and farms and one with passive solar greenhouse case studies, which I was referring to earlier. Um, if you like this sort of stuff, we offer online, uh, uh, sorry, we offer live permaculture design courses. Um, Every year we offer two or three of them in Western Canada. We also have online training with the Permaculture Pro webinar series where you can get information like this with a, a much smaller group of people and you can get all your questions answered about your own permaculture projects. And we also have consulting services available if you're interested. So thanks so much guys for participating in today's live call. We'll see you guys all next week. Um, I should mention one more thing. On Wednesday night at 6 p.m. Mountain Standard Time, we actually have uh, part two of our introduction to permaculture class. We had an incredible part one last week. We had over 100 people showing up with all sorts of unique questions. If you're new to permaculture and you wanna get into it and figure out if it's right for you, we're doing this as a way of allowing people to try it before they buy it. So there's no cost to you, just show up at our YouTube channel Wednesday night at 6 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. Thanks so much, guys. I hope you had a great evening. Uh, check out the, the video later this evening for all those resources. Thanks, Frankie. Thanks, David.
See you, Colin. Please, guys, if you uh, get a chance, just hit the like button. If you found this informative, it helps the channel to track.